What gets you up in the morning? The thought of something that I want to create. I've already been mulling over in my mind. And the first thing I want to do is pick up some paper and a pen and start writing, whether it's a sketch or getting those words down. What gets you angry? What gets me angry? To see, well, on a general level, misrepresentation of how the media will misrepresent uh, an argument. Like, for instance, in this controversy over ivermectin, you know, originally it was created for humans, and then the horse remedy was made. But you'll find the media oftentimes will refer to someone who's using that as using horse pills. So those kind of things, they're irritating. I don't lose sleep over it. It's just interesting to note. Uh, and aside from that, it's um, these days, it's just something in my own creativity, some blockage I, re I uh, hit, that's what makes me angry. What do you still hope to achieve? A body of work, a legacy that I can point to. Uh, I would love to collaborate with some people, find, find the right people. If you have a little bit of a, a lone wolf streak, which I, I think I do to some degree, it makes it a little harder because you naturally don't want to be around big crowds of people. You know, I do some background work sometimes, and I see what goes on a typical set, a Netflix production or something. There's hundreds of people running around. That's not what I want to do. But I, I, I want to have a legacy of just individual, unique, personal work, and hopefully uh, with others. It's not like I have a big agenda I prefer to sort of let the work, the body of work, lead me wherever it's going to lead me. May the work speak for itself. Exactly. You're listening to Artist with Brian. I'm Brian here with... Dean Balsamo. Dean is a poet, a writer. What else, Dean? Well, I use films to uh, emphasize and add a fuller picture to that poetry or whatever the writing is. It was a case of wanting to see my words live instead of just be tucked away in a journal or a script that may never get produced. It just became increasingly clear over time. I wanted to hear my words spoken and out there in the, in the air, and so I started doing it myself. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's my call to adventure as well. Produce my own writing. Season three of Artist with Brian is brought to you by howtoplaypoker.video. Do you wish you knew more about poker? Do you get embarrassed when you play with family and friends? Learn winning strategies completely free. Visit howtoplaypoker.video now. Also rate this podcast five stars in Apple Podcasts. Leave a written review. The most recent review at the time of the 50th rating will win a $50 iTunes gift card sent via email. As a kid, Dean, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, that's, uh, I think because I was raised in the 50s, I had sports in mind. I played a lot of sports. But one thing I came across a few years ago was someone said, look to what you were imagining yourself as, as a 12, 14-year-old person. And at that time, I was picking up a Super 8 camera uh, from my father and shooting my brothers and sisters in little skits. And I saw myself uh, on stage performing. It was definitely, it was something I didn't share with anyone. I mean, I did a little bit of, you know, school activities, but it wasn't like a real declaration. But it was a hidden dream that over time, and uh, especially now, has surfaced again, and I find a lot of satisfaction in it. Beautiful. What What were you like in high school? High school, I was a uh, sort of a hybrid jock. I played all kinds of sports. I played football uh, for four years. I went to a Catholic high school. Football track, um, and 
I had my athletic friends, but I also had like the quirky people in school. I just have always had an appreciation for the eccentric characters and activities. So I sort of had friends in both camps and a little bit of a comedian or prankster, I guess you, you would say, and uh, certainly sort of a loud mouth. So. It was like a hybrid role? Hybrid. What yeah. position were you on the football team? I played uh, a fullback and a wingback on offense and a cornerback on defense. Mm. And we had uh, one of our coaches was, uh, his last name was Copay. And his brother later came out as like the first gay football player, played for the 49ers. But it was a very rigorous um, training. We were taught to use our helmet to butt someone in the sternum, to hit them in the sternum. And we forced a lot of fumbles and that kind of stuff. But we were a small team, but we stayed in good shape. And leading with your helmet now is illegal in the NFL because of the neck injury? I believe so. Okay. Because it's like a bullet yes. coming at a, well, I don't know what, it what is. to compare it's, it to, a hard car bumper. <laughs> it's pretty strange. You have to yeah. pull your own neck, and then mm. you head for it, and it's uh, it's uh, brutal. That's wild. Yeah. So you were you were an artist, but also uh, a an brute athlete, yeah. on the football team. A brute, yes. But um, you know, luckily I had other friends that weren't uh, of the same type. So mm-hmm. it was Los Angeles, and so there was a lot of... Uh, uh, other kinds of activities and focus than than it would be in a, say in a small small town where you know sports was everything. So what was the first time you appeared on stage, either as a performer or you're writing on a figurative stage? Um, hmm. I would say back in the '90s is when I first started doing performance pieces where I actively put myself on stage aside from school activities. Um, I spent a lot of time traveling in my 20s and and early 30s. And I did write, I wrote some pieces in New York for some art art papers when I was an art dealer back there in the 80s. But it wasn't until Santa Fe that I began to do stage type things. Fascinating. So the the image as a kid, um, it it didn't come to fruition until you moved to Santa Fe. That's right. Okay. And I was like a lot of people, at least a lot of people that I knew of a certain time. We were called here. Yeah. It's hard to describe, but I think many people understand. It was I, I had passed through here when I was a kid through Albuquerque, and I remember the red dirt. And that image sort of stayed with me. And finally, in my late 20s, I found myself making a pilgrimage here. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you refused the call between 18 and 28 or... Uh, wherever about it was no i think it just welled up i was living in montreal canada and read the book the hopi for some reason i was drawn that and then this idea of santa fe just started welling up and it was just a, a feeling that just grew stronger and stronger and brought yeah, me out here that's how it went for me too so interesting uh we're gonna play a little game dean you're a poet and my favorite poet is emily dickinson so i'm gonna read a poem by her called I Felt a Funeral in My Brain. It's five stanzas, and I'm going to leave the last word of the fourth line of every stanza blank and see if you can fill it in. If you can go three for five, you'll win this very fine VHS copy of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Okay. So we'll test your (laughs) poetic intuition. I Felt a Funeral in My Brain by Emily Dickinson. I felt a funeral in my brain and mourners to and fro. Kept treading, treading, till it seemed that sense was breaking. Into hell. Through. And when they all were seated, a service like a drum kept beating, beating, till I thought my mind was going numb. Wooey! And then I heard them lift a box and creak across my soul with those same boots of lead again. Then space began to fall toll as all the heavens were a bell and being but an ear and i in silence some strange race wrecked solitary
store here. So that was a must get. So you will not win the VHS. We'll do the last stanza for everyone's satisfaction. And then a plank in reason broke. And I dropped down and down and hit a world at every plunge and finished knowing. Very hard one. Rhymes with down. It's a slant rhyme. Round then. So that was a lot harder game than I imagined. You got one right, though. Let's go back. So you you rhymed numb with drum. So very good, Dean. Was that fun for you? Miserable? No, it's good. It's a, it's a good challenge. I mean, it's important because um, especially if you're seeking to find a r- rhythmic or lyrical run to the words. I mean, um, no, great exercise. Yeah, and she doesn't always rhyme. So it's kind of an exciting Emily Dickinson poem. Uh, who's your favorite writer, Dean, of any medium, genre, era? Well, I love Bukowski, just the rawness. Uh, I love his poetry uh, quite a bit. And uh used to read a, a poem a night for a while of Bukowski's. Um, I enjoyed Philip Dick when I was younger, hmm. read a number of his books, uh, found him pretty uh, prophetic, actually talking about the sun and heat and, and, you know, androids and clones. Um, I've been reading a strange person lately. Evola is his last name, Mm -hmm. E-V-O-L-A. He was an artist involved with Dada, Italian artist, but also wrote about a lot of uh, strange subjects, uh, esoteric, occult, like uh, spiritual and religious traditions throughout time, about race, about politics. Um, and uh, I'm always looking for a writer that's going to get me thinking. Mm-hmm. You know? So it there'll be a variety of different people I'll pick up from time to time. Yeah. yeah I Space. Tried, yeah. Space. I yeah. love your NASA, uh, short NASA film. It's a poem, oh. would you describe, as an, an Instagram story? Yes. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. so that's a way of giving life, breathing life into the written word. Yeah. Well, I think f- a lot of times if you can express something in poetry or some sort of prose, you often can do a subject more service because you get a little emotional impact going versus just a straight data mm-hmm. or descriptive narrative of, of some things. Well, what's the pain point you were feeling with the written word? Uh, why'd you take it to, to Instagram stories? That's where I'm interfacing with that. Uh, I wanted to see my words live. 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 Uh, I, you know, I write every day. I, I mean, it's a it's a thing that I do, like a, a job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was writing, I went back to writing scripts again. But, you know, the, the chance of getting a script done is almost nil. Mm-hmm. Despite all the teachers there on Instagram and everywhere else and i've read a lot of the books and done you know classes and this and that but uh it was really the growing frustrated with not hearing maybe things i wanted to hear Mm -hmm. so i decided to do them myself it's almost like cindy sherman and her photographs just taking yourself and planting yourself in the middle of it all but Mm -hmm. i just wanted to hear the words live and then Part of that, and, and if you get into poetry, is uh, poetry was recited, poetry was sung, poetry was enacted. And so with film, you can bring in a visual image that doesn't necessarily have to be connected to the words, but it allows, I try to do it so that the viewer can put together their own context. They mm-hmm. can hear the words. Uh, I have some familiarity with sound, so I put together various tracks to to back it up and try to make a full experience of poetry versus just reading it, you know, so. Has it made you a better poet to hear it? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Better poet, and then uh, in my writing, uh, working on a couple of scripts, I'm finding I'm thinking more visually and I'm thinking more lyrically in terms Mm. of the, the lines themselves. And try to get a spirit rather than just, again, a, just a straight narrative in a script. I mean, Tarantino doesn't write a, you know, just a very um, 
slow, methodical thing. He, he uses descriptive words. He, he tries to paint a visual picture. So doing this on Instagram is first and foremost for me to hear the words and to learn from that mm-hmm. and become better at mm-hmm. what I'm doing. So Lyrical. I really am keying in on that word uh, in my own writing. Mm-hmm. I think stage plays knew they they knew because there wasn't much to capture your attention they knew the dialogue had to be a musical piece well i think films don't know yes. that yet no they they don't at least a lot of film writers don't yeah and you you and you and i have seen enough scripts or other people's we, we can see sometimes they that people get overly wordy in a in a place that so that's why i think poetry and and film writing go hand in hand right that's know? probably the best if you wanted to recruit talent Mm-hmm. It's poets. It's not. They get a lot of stage. Well, stage writing and stage playwriting. Writing. Playwriting would be then a very good place too. And I know that's mm-hmm. a common crossover. A New York agent will try to sell a script for their playwright. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, but just poets in general. I think they could, yeah. poets would be great. Well, playwrights. You, yeah, playwrights. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, uh, poetry. You you sort of have to be concise, and you want words that explode like. Someone just said, uh, "Blood on the page." You you want an emotional component and a paint a visual picture, and you have to do it in so many lines. What do you think so, about Arthur Miller said, "In between the lines, it's exploding all the time." Yes, well, that's a something you hear sometimes, and it's it's almost like a koan, you know, like a like a Zen koan, like a the master gives you this thing to ponder. Oh yeah. And so it's between lines because you hear that sometimes. And I, I often kind of think about it. Okay. So what is going on between those lines and and how can that, how can I bring that to the surface? I suppose it's like the downbeat in a musical score or the, the quiet portion. The notes you don't hear, the notes that are like a misdirect you, it's predictable in the scale and then you don't hear it or it goes minor. Exactly. Yeah. And you've got a, as an artist, any kind of creator, uh, I know when I was watching or when I was reviewing art, I was seeing 150 shows a year for several years. There's something called a finish fetish where some mm. artists overwork something, maybe with a goal. They think it has to be perfectly rendered versus what's going to keep the charge in that thing. Sometimes they overwork it. And so as any kind of artist, you want to be aware of how to play with that predictability, you know, to pull it out or to give it a twist mm-hmm. to make your work, you know, strike a different chord in people. I've learned my rough draft comes out with rhythm in screenwriting, mm-hmm. not just the dialogue, but mainly in the action description. Mm-hmm. It has rhythm baked into the sentences. Mm-hmm. And then when I revise and edit and polish for clarity, I lose the rhythm. So yeah. there's definitely something uh, there with over optimizing language. Um, there is. I, I think. Uh, you know, for when you're writing a script, you you have to think of the reader mm-hmm. first and foremost, don't you? I mean, unless you have a direct conduit to a producer, a director, maybe knows your work or so on, but that reader who's vetting it has to be get a charge. And so, if your words are a little more lyrical and descriptive, then you stand out. Mm-hmm. What's the longest thing you've ever written? Longest thing. Um, I've written, uh, I did a documentary, a docudrama, I should say, of about 150 pages on a Russian artist that I knew, mm-hmm. a famous Russian artist who came to this country and died a few years ago. Mm. Uh, and I did a a novella last year. It wasn't that it was so long, uh, but it was packed, and it took a lot of uh, attention. It was sort of like a novel. It was based on... Um, a period in my life in the 1970s when I was in Canada. Mm. I was in a circle of occultists and smugglers and uh, addicts. In Canada? Yeah. Exciting. <laughs> Montreal, yeah. It's a very, uh, what's the word I would want to use? Mm. It sort of sucks you in on a certain level when it comes to vice or what people think you're or you know, then it was like really bohemian kind of behavior. But it, it, Montreal is an interesting city. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I'm surprised you didn't say a novel. I, I, you, have you tried one and just not gotten to page 150? Uh, I have done. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I did one in the 80s, actually, about a trip uh, to Mars. Now you're jogging my memory. Uh, in, in the 80s, I wrote a number of film scripts, and uh, I wrote a, about a story of an international space crew going to Mars. Uh -huh. There was eight people. There were a couple of Russians. There were uh, some Afro-Americans and uh, their journey. And there was a, a Hopi Indian, and he has this revelation in space where he begins to see uh, Kachina figures and so forth. But I, I kind of forgot about that, yeah. But, uh, yeah, the novel's on my mind. It's just, uh, you know, getting that not only time, but in the right mental space to mm -hmm. do it. And and I, like, while I read books and I've, I go back and forth with fiction. I read a lot, a lot of nonfiction, but um, I've been reading a lot of fiction lately. Uh, it's just finding that mental space to kind of tackle it, so... Yeah, I I haven't written a book, nonfiction or fiction, and I just always, if I as I approach it, it seems so massive. Um, I feel like you're everything. All the stars have to align. You have to really be on a mission to say something that you well, can't else? articulate in any yes. other form. Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite. It's uh, they say writing a script is a marriage, or making a movie is a marriage. But I think writing a book is like a maybe a painful marriage, no matter how you slice it. It it definitely could be, but you know maybe slicing is the key, is to think about it in terms of sequences, like you might uh, a film script acts, somehow finding a way to break a, a bigger task down to smaller units. I think will help you to to move forward, mm -hmm. you know, versus looking at it the whole big picture at once all the time. So, amen. So you've been in Santa Fe for uh, what over fifty years. Uh, well, let's see. I got here in the late 70s, uh, left like a lot of people, came back in uh, 1980, stayed for several years, left, came back in 85 with my future wife for a few, for about 10 months, went back east. So we've been back about 30 years now. Oh, in yeah. aggregate? Yes. Oh, neat. Well, yes, in straight in straight years. Mm -hmm. So you came here on a pilgrimage, as so many people do, um, 30 30 years or more of wisdom and experience. What's been the biggest disappointment since arriving in Santa Fe itself as it appears? In I think the biggest disappointment is to see the change in attitude among the city at large, or at least a lot of the people that influence how the city presents itself. Mm. I feel that there was a lot more um, just freedom of expression individually, and it wasn't such a, a consensus and group thing, especially among artists. Hmm. It seems like, um, you know, maybe it's because we're it's the days of social media, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there's more of a group think versus the idiosyncratic kinds of. Uh, people and eccentrics you would find. But I think what happens over time is people become a little more reclusive. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that with a lot of artist friends and so forth. So. so you think the real mavericks in Santa Fe, your peers, um, aren't coming out on podcasts? They're hiding in, uh, in maybe some nice adobe houses? I think they are, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's been the biggest surprise? What's worked out better than you could ever have imagined? I think... Being able to raise a family here, own a home, live a a really nice quality of life in a in a beautiful place, yeah, with a generally great vibration. I mean, a creative one, uh, almost mystical because of our mountain setting and so forth. So I've been, I'm, I can't imagine living anywhere else. Me neither. Very cool. Uh, before we go to the Clay Pot, which is a collection of fan questions, and uh, to our listeners, we have brand new fan questions. Uh, Dean will get every single one of them <laughs> asked to him, so they won't be randomly pulled. Maybe we'll go for one random at the end. I want to thank our newer sticker partners. We got three newer ones. I'll do the rest at the end of the show. But the special thank you to Sun Green Cleaner, 10% off your first clean, the highest quality green cleaning services 
For your home or business in Santa Fe and the surrounding areas, use code AWB10 for 10% off your first cleaning. Ask for Noel, Sun Green Cleaner on Instagram. Also, special thanks to Wayward Comedy. Do comedy any Wednesday, 8 p.m. Chili Lime Brewery open mic. Sign up on a clipboard when you arrive at Wayward Comedy on Instagram. And a special, special, special thanks to Cry Like Donna, Santa Fe's premier tape label. Buy a tape for a loved one today. CryLikeDonna.bandcamp.com. I love that, Cry Like Donna. Oh, yeah. yeah. Theo Krantz, the CEO, founder of that tape label, was guest number four, if uh, anybody wants to go back into the archive and meet Theo. Dean, first fan question from Jeff.Gonzalez.1088. As an artist, have you been able to make a living solely from your art? And if not, what's your day job? I have not made my living because um, I realized that for me, I may have other responsibilities with the children, but so forth. Right now, my day job is uh, a non-paying gig on Instagram and writing my film scripts. That's funny. I finished, I worked for 20 years in the magazine industry oh. and doing marketing and sales for a magazine distributor up in Denver. And I worked out of my office here remotely, and I'd get on a plane about 30 times a year. Oh, my God. Did this for 20 years. Um and that stopped a few years back, and I haven't really sought any employment in that area. I, I just sort of would rather concentrate on my creativity at this point. Okay. But, uh, yep, flew all over the country. I uh, would meet with owners of and general managers and vice presidents of grocery stores and uh, try to get them to use our magazine services. And I helped design fixtures like at Whole Foods, the check stand fixtures and that sort of thing. So I did that. and. In the past, I've uh, been on the radio. Uh, yeah, I've made money from different create creative projects over the years, mm -hmm. but never enough to, um, you know. I think once we had children, it was more okay. <laughs> if you had two children, you got to put some bread on the table here. Mm -hmm. so, so that's an interesting answer. So media related, tangentially related to art. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, almost everything I've done, I've worked in radio. Uh, been an art dealer. Um, wow. I, I'm a I'm a career. I'm a serious. I'm a career serialist. Uh, something, but yeah, maybe me yeah. too. But you know, always with the best yeah. possible connotation. Yes, but but you're right. They've all been sort of more or less in the same vein, and I mm. think that's an important uh, path to look at. Uh, there's a term called talent stacking. That this, oh wow. That uh, Scott Adams uh, promulgates and. It basically is about adding different talents as you go along that are more or less in the same vein. And you don't have to be the best at anything, but, you know, it builds up over time. You yeah, you're the only person with such and such mix mm -hmm. of talents. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Absolutely. I've heard that. I, I, I think independent of you, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. So that's a meme traveling around talent stacking everybody. Google it right now. This one comes from Sun Chase Moon. As an artist, which is more important to you, beauty or dysfunction? Well, you know, beauty is a, uh, I guess I would say that the beauty of any dysfunction that's there. If, I mean, dysfunction is, is something, you know, it's one of those terms, what does that mean exactly? What's the context? And the same with beauty. I mean, as a art critic and artist myself, beauty is something that, you know, depending on the person is, 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 uh, absorbed or not considered beauty or, or, or is. So for myself, um, I guess I would say beauty in the sense that whatever is there works in a harmonious manner. It can be, it can look ugly to the eyes, but if it, work somehow if it creates this hole that then you've achieved a certain beauty well absolutely tragedy my favorite uh that form sounds... of dramatic writing uh, the, the the main goal is catharsis well there you go well look at russian artists yeah throughout the last century or so i think there's a lot of that in involved in their work another question from e amazing adventures 20 are you more inspired by your conscience conscious or subconscious mind 
I would say my subconscious mind because uh, the cues for whatever I write or my film or so on can come from anywhere. I can be on a hike, I can hear a phrase, and it's something that goes below the normal consciousness and, and gets in there and starts working. So definitely subconscious. Yeah. Cool. We'll do one more uh, of these new ones. If you guys want to submit a fan question, go to Artist with Brian on Instagram. Leave it as a comment on any post. I'll find it. Uh, maybe hashtag Clay Pot, hashtag fan question. This one, Dean, comes from Designated Films. In your art, what wastes the most time but has to be done? Um, well, in the films, editing, mm. basically, because uh, I found while I started off very simple in the films I was doing, over time I naturally wanted to get more impact, so it involves more cuts. Like I think about eight, I strive for about seven to eight uh, different cuts in a 30-second film. Wow. Because it's something to do with the attention span and what we're used to. And, I mean, if you don't have a, well, maybe okay. I shouldn't say it, but uh, you, you know, you've got to make it move and you've got to grab people right from the beginning. And so uh, I will often spend, because of the nature of the editing tools, unless, you know, I have to make little snippets and then subject those to certain filters. And I don't stop with one filter. Yeah. I'll often, you know, and I'm using different speeds and so forth. So what I do is I do I do sketch out a sort of sequence, but it takes a while sometimes to get all those different parts to there. Mm -hmm. And of course then there's a the writing aspect and then if I'm have a musical track. So it's just the editing process in all the way around. So you're talking yeah. seven or eight cuts in a fifteen second thirty second. Thirty. 30. Yeah. That's so neat. It's yeah, I, I would never think of breaking it down like that. The number of cuts you have in a in a story. Yes, yes. But I, isn't yeah. that exactly just in a feature length film? You have I don't even know how many yeah. uh, thousand, maybe. Yeah, well, depending on what you yes. call cut. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, mm -hmm. it's. Uh, I, I guess I've been influenced a lot by um, the writing of David Mamet on directing. Oh and also yeah, I love that book. The, the Russians, uh, you know, this idea of of montage of of having what Mamet would call an uninflected image. Juxtaposed. Yeah, juxtaposed. Uh -huh. And so I, I think about that uh, and, and the visual impact. And, of course, then there, there's the words. and But a lot of it, too, you, uh, is serendipity. I mean, I work a lot with serendipity. Something just happens. It's hmm. the same in the visual arts. Like something that looks like a mistake actually turns out to be the key to giving it this life it didn't have before so i'm sort of on the lookout for those kinds of things and I, mm -hmm. I i don't you can't plan you can plan everything out but i think for myself i like to leave a little uh room there for something just to strange to happen that's neat different. what yeah. was the origin of sex in space i w they'll sex have heard that or they're about yeah. to hear it um in sex post in here yeah. well um i have thought uh i've thought about what kind of beings are going to go out to space? Are we going to send clones out there? Are we going to send... I'm thinking people will definitely be chipped some sort, but I, I... Because I think about sex and like sex... I've written about sex robots before and maybe their impact on human relations, uh, which actually could be really positive in the end. Um, but um, it's just one of those subjects that I, I heard one little something one time about it that it was like something that they really just don't talk about. Yeah. And that supposedly there were experiments. So I thought, ah. why don't I just do something a little That's strange and different? I here. love it. So. It hooked me immediately. Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, great opening line. Doesn't it just start sex in space? Uh, yes. I like as though you're an investigative reporter? <laughs> yes, exactly. It's really that's, cool. That's what I did. I like the idea of mockumentaries. Yeah. You know, I did several back in the 90s. Didn't really get them... I mean, I got one completed, and uh, but that idea because it just is another way of looking and sort of pokes fun a little bit at our different ways. Very good. Cool. We'll do one random question for you okay. out of these fifty or so in the actual clay pot. Final fan question, Dean. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, can you remember? To be here. Thank you. Can you remember a near-death experience? 
Yes, I, I can. I um, About, oh, 10 years ago, I, I took a uh, trip. I had one of my business trips, and I came through El Paso. I had a little stop over there. And the next day, I was uh, on my back. I had like some sort of viral thing, and my fever was climbing. And we didn't call doctor right away, but I, I felt like I was um, – really like I was dying my and I it was just really weird and then uh we had these some pills that came in a brown paper bag uh from Greece or something like homeopathic pills and and this doctor friend that we knew said well, why don't you give it to him because I felt like I was dying and so mm-hmm. uh luckily they they worked and so forth uh I'm just Kind yeah. of thinking, but a virus, yeah. a virus just takes you over. Well, it was. you don't even possess your own body anymore. Something else yeah. outnumbers you. I felt like I was being overwhelmed. Yeah, it was the strangest thing. I was ebbing away. Uh, I have felt like, yeah, I guess that would be the closest, I suppose. Mm. Thank you to our other three sticker partners to date, Oasis Camper Vans, Minivan, Convergence, so good. Most of their customers are out of state. Follow them. Check out the craftsmanship at Oasis Camper Vans on Instagram. Thank you to Santa Fe Independent Film Club. Every Saturday, 4 to 6 p.m. at Boxcar in Santa Fe, meet like-minded people, talk film. And thank you to our very first ever sticker partner, Santa Fe Human Rights Alliance. Visit hrasantafe.org for a list of upcoming events. Dean, if you could change one thing about this podcast, what would it be? I really can't think of anything at the moment. I think that you have your style, and, uh, you know, who am I to judge? It has a nice rhythm to it. You've obviously done some preparation, and you've learned from what you've been doing in the past. I think uh, there's nothing I really can add. I think you just need to keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. And where where should people go right now to follow you? They can go to Instagram. Uh, my handle is at raw at I'm sorry at arcane space a r c a n e s p a c e one word. And I don't do Facebook, but I do Instagram. That's pretty much the prime area to any longer or older stuff on youtube no i I would like to actually do a youtube channel i started i tried vimeo but i didn't really um keep up with it i sometimes when it's sometimes when it's just yourself you know doing all the different things i i i post a little bit on twitter most of my my instagram films uh but that's sort of just a uh something i do but my main focus at this point is instagram and if you want to see an example of what i do that's the place to go follow dean follow the show at arcane space on instagram thank you so much dean my pleasure an honor you're listening to artist with brian i'm brian here with jeff gonzalez jeff is a filmmaker sound editor Music producer. I dig it, man. I say we try it for season three. Do you want it at the beginning and the end? Yeah, I think it'll sound great. I say I say, I thank you every episode at the end. Like, I'll shout out your Instagram handle for your music if you have one. To cater to your taste. To cater to your taste.